Although relatively peaceful compared to its neighbors, Cameroon is still desperately poor, with a per capita GDP of only $1,300 per year. Energy scarcity is a major hindrance to development of this country, as with all of sub-Saharan Africa. In 2010, the International Energy Agency estimated that only about 12% of rural areas in Africa have electricity. Our story is about a relatively small run-of-the-river project of around 50 megawatts which would bring much-needed power in remote parts of Cameroon. To improve electrification, international donors, particularly the World Bank, are investing in power schemes across the continent. We visited one such project in a remote eastern part of Cameroon called Lompangar, which could potentially provide electricity for most of eastern Cameroon. However, a major motivator for this dam is industrial development, particularly providing power to expand an aging aluminum smelter several hundred kilometers downstream. Rio Tinto Alcan, an international minerals conglomerate, requires this power for its expansion plans. The government believes that this could in turn lead to economic growth of up to 10% as other industries gain strength from this sector. While such industrial development may indeed lead to an improvement in macroeconomic indicators for Cameroon, the daily lives of those in close proximity to the project remain uncertain. Will those who toil in these difficult areas be able to get out of their predicament? After driving down a muddy road for about three hours from the town of Bertua, we reached the area which would be impacted by the dam. The chiefs and community members we meet are not against the dam per se, but would like to have more involvement in the planning process. Cameroon has recent experience with international donor consultations pertaining to infrastructure, particularly with reference to an oil pipeline which was completed from Chad through Cameroon in 2005. Despite the World Bank's efforts at proper consultation and oversight, the dominance of national decision-making prevailed and the bank withdrew its support and oversight of the project in 2008. Local NGO representatives shared some of the lessons from that project which might inform efforts in this context as well. The key lessons that we have got uh, on the Cameroon, Chad Oil, Cameroon Oil and Power Line project are the following. First, that the civil society has a great role to, uh, to play as far as environmental protection is concerned. Because when the, the first carry out the environmental impact assessment, the civil society did a critical analysis which helped to improve the report as well as the report of uh, on compensation. The second lesson that they can learn is that the monitoring was poorly done because the bodies which were coming out of work were very far from the project site. That is, you had the environmental conformity monitoring group which was based in Italy, and then the the the, the GIC, that is a, a company which was based in Canada. So they were coming only to use secondary data. Compensation to communities was also not properly monitored, leading to social disruption rather than wealth creation. Yes, as far as management of compensation uh, was concerned, we can give some some examples. Okay, there was somebody who got a lot of million of CFA and then he started playing the high life and then uh, some people, they haven't uh, got married to many women, so, but some go with girls to the hotel and then in less than six months, they spend all the money they got and then well, they, they, they lost the production tool, which was the method of their land. Reaching the construction site, we also spoke to some local workers who are gaining livelihoods from the project. It is estimated that in this rural area of around 30,000 people, about 1,500 jobs will be created over the four years construction of the project. Wives of the workers and other community members also spoke out about their concerns. 
Muslims and Christians live in relative harmony in this part of rural Cameroon. Around 20% of the country is Muslim and several Arab states such as Libya have investments here. The Saudi Development Fund has also contributed around $25 million to the project's total cost of over $300 million. We also spoke to the local imam who expressed concerns over the lack of direct interaction between the donors and the village leadership organizations. The chief in the village that is closest to the dam construction site expressed his continuing concern. Only the day before he indicated that several SUVs with donors had driven to the construction camp and not one had stopped to greet him or the villagers. The situation here is also compounded with a simmering conflict over the designation of a new national park at the nearby Deng Deng forest. Environmental NGOs such as the Wildlife Conservation Society will be managing the park and have hired some local villagers to assist them. However, local villagers who used parts of the reserve for subsistence activities are now being asked to relocate since gorillas in this region are often attracted to banana trees planted by subsistence farmers and often become easy targets for poachers. Conservation, energy and livelihoods are inextricably bound in such areas. People are willing to give up individual goals for the greater good of development or the environment. However, they deserve to have a clear and respectful process that ensures that the promise of development and environmental conservation positively touches their lives.